welcome uh, to our webinar. Um, I'm your host and moderator today. My name is Jen. Um, just real quick, uh, some housekeeping notes before we start. Uh, first and foremost, we are recording this session. We will clean it up and send it to everyone within 24 to 48 hours of the session. Um, I encourage everyone to include your questions in the Q&A window below. We will address them as we go throughout the discussion and then uh, follow up with the remainder at the end of wrap up and Q&A. Uh, and then last but not least, if you are experiencing any audio or visual issues, um, sometimes uh, it's as simple as logging out and logging back in uh, often not uh, does the trick. Um, so let us know if you have any questions. I'll be monitoring the chat as we go through. Uh, real quick, uh, I'll introduce the panelists. We'll dive right into the panel discussion and then close up with final thoughts and wrap up in Q&A. So first and foremost, uh, Laura Behrens Wu uh, is the CEO and co-founder of Shippo. Uh, we are a shipping platform for 21st century e-commerce. Uh, we power over 35,000 SMBs and direct-to-consumer brands. Uh, Neil Jones Shaw has over 25 years of industry experience at global companies overseeing Flexport's operational and commercial air freight strategy, as well as carrier and client relations. And then last but not least, Nick Shockhead is a senior ops leader with over 15 years of supply chain experience in a number of industries. His experience in direct to consumer and big box operations has led him to his current role at Hims and Hers, which is a healthcare startup. Uh, and with that, let's go ahead and kick things off. Um, with the growing impact of COVID-19 progressing, um, I'd love to start with Laura. What trends do you anticipate going forward as this pandemic continues? Yeah, thanks for hosting today. Um, so, I mean, I think it starts out with we're seeing, um, I mean, right right before the, the pandemic started, I think the latest that I saw on, on e-commerce was that roughly uh, in the U.S., roughly e-commerce is roughly 15% of total addressable market. And uh, so that's comparatively low. It's only 15%. There was a lot of opportunity for growth around e-commerce. And I think with this uh, um, situation going on, the, the consensus is that we're going to see a lot of growth in e-commerce. So the, the market share of e-commerce will grow from 15% to maybe 50, 60, or even 70%. More people are going to be buying online. There's going to be that, that real shift in behavior of people right now being forced to buy online because they can't go out and can't go shopping outside anymore. But then um, that, that behavioral change will, will prevail as, as situations become more normal again, more people will just be used to buying online and the market share of, of e-commerce will be much greater than 15%. And I think we were on that track before this already. So people were saying that 15% is, is quite low and it is going to be growing over the next few years, but this is just accelerating that trend and making the change happen faster. And um, we are seeing that in, in our like recent signups and, and the recent customer behavior as well. Like a lot of offline businesses or businesses that were, were previously offline businesses, mostly relying on, on brick and mortar stores and foot traffic um, are now trying to figure out how to become online businesses because there, there is no foot traffic anymore and people are get, becoming very creative around how to turn their offline locations into warehouses, for example, and how to, how to make sure that they're that they're becoming online businesses as fast as possible. Yeah, I think with that as well, we're going to see the need for additional uh, volume for small parcel carriers and final mile delivery. And everyone's been pretty well trained at the moment to expect a two day delivery. And I think there's going to have to be some um, new learning from people to maybe uh, loosen their expectations for for delivery on an ongoing basis, or at least as the sort of shipping and final mile delivery um, networks catch up with the added volume. Hey, this is uh, this is Neil. And first, I want to thank uh, Jen and Laura for, for inviting me uh, to join. I'll, I'll take a little bit different um, stance and I'll approach it from a global sort of supply chain um, uh, angle and, and not, you know, just specifically from e-commerce, because I completely agree with what Nick said, you know, for the final final mile needs, but but also with what Laura said on e-commerce penetration, definitely going to go up at least in the short term. I mean, it remains to be seen, um, you know, if if we'll go back to to sort of uh, normalized levels uh, post crisis. Um, but but certainly, e-commerce is the only way that people are able to to do their consumption today. Um, but from a global supply chain, you know, perspective, here's here's kind of what we're seeing. Um, is that, uh, you know, this, this pandemic is, is having a dramatic impact on commercial volume. 
So, you know, just as Chinese factories got back online, this, this, this pandemic, you know, obviously spread around the world. And with most of the consumption taking place in Europe and, and, and in the U.S., um, we have seen, uh, you know, dramatic fall off in, in, uh, in, in commercial volumes um, over the past couple weeks and expect this trend to continue. Now, what is sort of masking this is, is, is two things. Um, first and foremost is, is that a lot of capacity that, that, that's used to move uh, particularly air freight has been shut down um, because 45% uh, of the world's cargo moves on passenger airplanes. And with the, essentially the passenger schedule suspended globally, we've lost a lot of capacity. And freighters aren't, aren't able to, to make up nearly um, you know, that difference. They made up a little bit, but not nearly all of it. So we have this dramatic fall off in capacity. We also have this uh, very huge spike in demand for personal protective equipment. I'm sure all of you watch the news and you know what a dire situation we're in, um, in many parts of the US and in Europe as well, um, with the lack of PPE. So you know the, the, the crush of demand for this product that normally would never travel on, in an airplane, would always go on an ocean carrier, um, is now kind of creating this artificial demand um, for air freight. But but the underlying um, commercial demand has definitely fallen off. And we expect with all of these retail locations closed, a lot of our big retail customers, their warehouses are completely full. They have no place to put this inventory. Um, we're seeing a lot of purchase orders being canceled. So um, expect this trend uh, you know, to continue. And actually, once we get over the crush of PPE, um, I would anticipate that rates would start to come down. Um, to more normalized levels as we approach, you know, mid to end of, uh, of Q2. So to quickly jump in here, when we were preparing for uh, this webinar, you, you started talking to us about how um, like commercial airplanes are also used for, for, for cargo space. And I thought that was a pretty interesting tidbit that most of our um, attendees probably don't know. Can you expand a little on that? Yeah, sure, sure, Jen. Um, so you, you, um, you're exactly right. Is that um, you know, as 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 a lot of the world's uh, carriers have shut down their passenger operations, um, there has there has a unique opportunity has been created for them to use some of their wide body fleet, the most capable wide body airplanes, to just carry cargo. So just in the belly of, of the airplane. Some of you have seen pictures too of some airlines that are actually loading boxes on their seats as well. Um, you know, to, to help maximize, you know, the capability of the airplane. Um, but, but that is absolutely happening. Um, you know, there are probably 100 passenger um, airplane operated flights, you know, on a daily basis right now that are just carrying cargo is kind of the, the, the latest estimation. Now, it's, it, it's, it's, it helps on the capacity side. It by no means makes up for, for the loss of, 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 the, of the overall um, uh, global fleet, um, but, but it certainly helps. And the reason airlines can do this is, is threefold. Um, fuel is super cheap right now. Jet fuel is less than a dollar a gallon. It's at, at you know, lows we haven't seen in 20 years. Um, you're already paying the pilots. Most pilot contracts have minimum hours, and so you're paying them. So they either work or they sit at home. And, and third, uh, you know, there's really no opportunity cost for the asset. You either park the airplane um, in short-term storage or you use it for this activity. So many airlines are finding a way to, to get these airplanes back in the air just moving cargo. We actually had a question real quick come in um, in terms of uh, what are lockdowns and how do they affect overall supply chain activities? Well, you know, I'll, I'll answer it from a, from a Flexport perspective. I mean, you know, lockdowns, you know, clearly if, uh, if, if lockdowns then make their way into, um, into the factory environment, um, and in many states, you know, depending on how essential your industry is, you're having to shut down. And we've seen now the automotive industry in both Europe and the US have shut down. Um, for how long, nobody knows. It could last through the end of April. Um, but you know, the impact on the supply chain is swift and severe because now you know, some of these industries relied very heavily on air freight for just-in-time sort of deliveries of components. And now with the factory shut down, they don't need that anymore. So you know, they, they immediately stop shipping whatever they were shipping. Um, and, and so then they'll have to restart that again um, you know, in the future, but but it does have a quitty, pretty um, swift and pretty severe impact on air freight demand. 
Thanks. Uh, and while I have you with one more uh, comment that just came in, uh, we are hearing that uh, rates for cargo lifts are now 3x or 4x usual rates. This is a huge cost increase for shippers. How long before we see this passed on, do you think, to customers? Yeah, great, great question. So I, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying 3x to 4x. Um, so you know, we we've probably seen about two and a half x, I would say. Um, you know, increase in rates, maybe 3x, depending on some lane segments. Um, here, here's what we're seeing right now is that we're seeing U.S. export rates kind of begin to normalize. And this is particularly due to the fact that, um, you know, uh, uh, commercial demand has really fallen over the past two or three weeks. So those rates are, are now almost back to normal, not to Europe, certainly to Asia, they're back to normal, you know, less than a dollar a kilo for air freight. Um, to Europe, um, they're, they're, they're higher than that. But, but trending downwards. Um, you know, in, in Asia, where we're seeing the biggest rate increase is Asia to the US and Asia to Europe, particularly China. And this is due to, I'll give you two reasons why. First is just this absolute crush of, of uh, personal protective equipment has caused rates to spike over the past, let's say, um, few weeks. But we also had this dramatic fall off in capacity. And Asia already was in a capacity demand imbalance. Demand already exceeded capacity. So when we lost all that passenger capacity, even though commercial demand has been a bit tepid this year, um, we were still in a massive undersupply situation. That's not the case in many other parts of the world where capacity always exceeded demand. So that's where you're seeing the biggest rate increases out of Asia, where you are seeing that two to three X sort of increase in rates. Great, thank you. And I, if I can loop back to the, the previous question, which was about the impact of the lockdown, I think from a fulfillment perspective as well, uh, if you are operating in uh, one of the industries that's considered essential and able to continue operating, you still are just a piece of the puzzle in getting products from your manufacturers uh, and to the end consumer's um, hands. So even if you are able to continue operating, you still are going to be impacted by slowdowns with uh, you know, small parcel carrier volume. You may also be impacted by some additional protective measures that you're putting in your fulfillment center or warehouses especially if you're using a third party uh, to do your fulfillment and you don't have as much control over their day-to-day -day operations, uh, you're going to see potentially decreased um, throughput in, in those locations in order to meet the demand. So there's definitely a lot of um, challenges that people are facing, even if they're able to continue operating under a lockdown. Uh, this is Laura from Shippo here. I, I had another question for you in terms of supply chain as well. Like I think when we prepared for this podcast, we were talking a little bit about holding inventory and um, how how that's going to impact uh, what like the the ability for retailers to be able to to sell and and ship to their customers. Um, how do you think will this situation impact uh, invent like holding inventory in the future and then then sourcing from different countries or different suppliers? Yeah, I think it's going to have, um, it's a, now is the time where a lot of uh, smaller uh, retailers that maybe hadn't built contingency plans uh, previously are going to be looking to put those, uh, those things in place so that they can diversify the manufacturers that they're working with. Um, they can look at stocking up on your key products that you're selling or materials that you need to run your business. Now's the time, well, potentially six months ago was the time, but if not, now you're gonna be looking towards the future and how you're gonna always be able to protect yourself in case anything like this happens again. All right, and, and Laura, if I just, I'll just jump in re really quickly to that question. I think that probably trends a little bit into the second question, Jennifer, that you're gonna ask is, um, is, is, is about you know, what lessons we've all learned with, with some, of the, um, some of the geopolitical things that have been going on over the past couple of years, right? So you talk about trade war, um, you know, this, this very quick imposition of tariffs uh, that many companies weren't prepared for. Um, you now talk about this global pandemic, um, which, which came upon us very quickly. But I, I, I agree with Nick is that a lot of companies are gonna start rethinking you know, their supply chain, start rethinking, do they need a secondary source of, of that component or, 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 or that material or whatever it might be in order to keep their business running and keep their cost structures sort of balanced, right? So 
Um, there is there is a lot of talk amongst you know I think companies big and small about how they think about their supply chains going forward and how they build in these safety valves um, in, in order to to be um, to be viable through these crises. Um, and and I, I think that there's going to be a lot of that. Um, uh, a lot of companies are going to be thinking that it's just it's not a decision that you can take in in a matter of weeks or even months because if you think about the billions and billions that have been spent on property, plant, and equipment in, in many of these countries, you just can't oftentimes pick it up and move it. Oftentimes you don't have trained workforces in places you wanna to move to. Um, so so these are, these are long-term decisions, but I think a lot of, a lot of companies are gonna be re revisiting that over the course of the next year or so. That actually brings us to a great segue until our second discussion point. So thank you um, for businesses, especially during this time. Um, what are some proactive tips, some tricks, uh, lessons on how to maximize efficiencies and minimize vulnerabilities uh, at this moment? Um, Neil, did you want to start? Yeah, sure. I mean, just tagging on to, 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 to what I said, I, I, I think that, um, you know, businesses need to look at, um, you know, near sourcing and far sourcing. Um, uh, you know, I think there's a combination of that that, that, that will, will make the most sense for them going forward and, and protect themselves. Um, uh, you, you know, you, you are, um, you, you constantly need to look at sort of your mode of transport. Um, while I'm an air freight guy, um, you know, I have been, you know, touting our premium ocean services more than ever, um, you know, these, these past few weeks, because, you know, while, while a lot of companies have a need for some air freight, um, clearly because they might be lacking a certain product or, you know, they were delayed getting manufacturing out of China due to the expanded uh, Chinese New Year, um, uh, you know, but, but a mix of uh, a sort of modal diversification. So you're not just reliant on one mode um, to transport your products is something that, um, uh, that, that would, I think, be of, of good use um, for a lot of people to think about, um, you know, des designing around these sorts of new realities that we're going to face, because I think these disruptions are not going to become less common, they're going to become more common, um, you know, going forward, and we have to be prepared for it. Yeah, I think um, now is the time to be really familiar with your supply chain, with every single one of the players from where you are manufacturing um, and into, your, into your domestic warehouse, uh, and looking at diversification and um, mitigating for risk as much as possible. Uh, as you said, um, certainly from the inbound transportation and then also from, you know, the, where these manufacturers are actually operating out of. Um, you need to know which of those links in the chain is most vulnerable um, and most critical to your business and then like work on solutions uh, for what were to happen if they weren't able to continue operating um, and, you know, make a plan with your team for each of those scenarios. Uh, Laura from Shripo here, just asking a question about that. Like, as you've done this for for hims and hers, like, what are some interesting anecdotes or or stories you can share as you were auditing the supply chain? Um, <laughs> wow. Um, I think that you know what we have found. We've been pretty fortunate to have quite a diverse um, group of manufacturers that we work with at the moment. Um, but it's what's been interesting is seeing how each of them is responding to this. Um, situation and we're seeing uh, we based on the state that they're they're located in and the sort of um, uh, state government level uh, stay at home regulations that have been put into place we're seeing very different things uh, we've had to shuffle around where we've got some of our raw, raw materials and some of our production um, but also the timing of when this happened with um, with like Chinese New Year being near the start of the year, we had kind of stocked up on a lot of the raw materials that we imported prior to this happening. So it gave us a little bit more time to react as this continued to evolve um, and to work with each of those sort of manufacturers to put in place, um, you know, forward looking plans, how we can maintain production over time. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I'll try to answer this question from, from my perspective as well, which is, not, um, which is a slightly different perspective because where Shippo comes in, like it, it, it would, like 
it's about having your items in place already and shipping them out. But I think there are a few things about the last mile delivery that are interesting and changing at this point as well. On the one hand, I think it was mentioned at the beginning, which is that shipping providers, transit times are slightly delayed right now. Um, I think they're, they're delayed across the board for, for most shipping providers last mile as well, because um, there is a, a disruption in the, in the shipping infrastructure and the last mile, last mile infrastructure around Right now, there's a surge in demand for certain products, but also um, there, there we're trying or carriers are trying to make their warehouses safer. So things are just a little more chaotic. And I would think that um, a package, if it's supposed to arrive within two days, you can expect slight delays and being just proactive about communicating these delays up front, especially um, given that consumers are probably going to be uh, quite understanding about the situation is something that you can do to make sure that customers are in the loop and and not surprised. Uh, that's a wonderful point. Um, we had uh, one question come in earlier uh, asking specifically about last mile shipping. Uh, they're asking, will everyday last mile shipping be affected? Do you think through this? Uh, oh, interesting. I, I also want to be aware. I think there was Neil wanted to jump in with with a, uh, another point before we get there. Yeah, I was just, I was just going to add uh, re re really quickly, guys. Just um, you know, from 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 our perspectives, you know, we we've uh, you know we we consult with a lot of our customers on on their supply chain strategy, and you know, going back to the start of the trade war, you know, a, a lot of customers uh, saw their vulnerability, you know, with their manufacturing base almost a hundred percent in China, and 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 they didn't know if there was going to be any end to this, and you know, for for some of them you know, 15, 20, 25% tariffs, you know, can, can destroy your entire business model, particularly if you're in a competitive industry where you can't pass along to the consumer. Um, and so, you know, what we found is that, you know, the, the companies that could easily pick up their, their, their equipment, basically, um, particularly, you know, the retail customers, the, the clothing manufacturers and all, where there was capable labor and trained labor in, in places in Southeast Asia, whether it's Cambodia and Myanmar, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, uh, Central, Central America, et cetera, you know, they, they you know, quite, quite quickly made the decision to start moving their infrastructure and their manufacturing out of China. Maybe not entirely, um, but they certainly split it. Now, you know, clearly if you move from China to Vietnam, you didn't necessarily um, solve, you know, the issue of the, the impact of this pandemic on your supply chain because you, you can't escape that. However, the ones who started production in Central America or in Mexico or places like that now are not, you know, modally dependent on air freight or ocean to get their product to market. You know, they can use a truck um, and, and, and trucking has, has moved actually quite seamlessly through this pandemic. So I, I think that, you know, all of these sorts of things are going to need to be taken into account. Um, you know, as people get back to work and think about, you know, what, what they're going to do to minimize vulnerability going forward. And uh, Jen, you asked a question, I think it came from the audience around yes. um, whether or not last mile will be impacted. And I Correct. see a few questions about last mile here. Another question I'm reading is that, what if um, other countries' postal services are closed? Will the packages get lost? Um, I think it, right now, especially j just talking about the US first. So shipping is an essential service. The USPS is a government owned organization. And I think uh, from, from that point of view, like. The USPS and then last mile delivery specifically through the USPS will, will for sure not get impacted. The USPS is, is working really hard on making sure that the, they're, they're able to still deliver to every household in the US, which is part of their mandate. So I, I think they're, like things would have to get very, very bad for, for that um, to happen. And right now, I, I don't anticipate that. Um, I do think that there are other uh, potential issues that will arise. Like on the one hand, um, we're starting to see a few carriers, especially for international shipping. I think DHL Express is a great example here. We're starting to see them add surcharges um, because of COVID. So shipping um, could get more expensive because of the current situation. And then carriers who are customers, e-commerce merchants who are uh, offering free shipping could be running into some trouble here and might have to pass on the cost to the consumers. So th that'll, that'll be um, one of the potential challenges. And then to this specific question around packages being lost. So I, I think as long as you are doing shipping with um, a tracking number, these are not like the, the 
shipping providers in other countries to postal services are not shutting down permanently. They're only like, closing temporarily. And as, as long as you have a tracking number, packages will, will not get lost. They will be delivered as normal as the operations are picking up again. Great. Uh, thanks, Laura, for diving into that. Um, I want to get to now uh, our third discussion point, uh, important to all of us, of course. What are some ways uh, and encourage some you know, real life examples here? We can connect more deeply with our customers and consumers during this time. Um, and Nick, I'd love to kick things off with you. Sure. Yeah. So I think um, as a, a slightly like unique perspective, as we're a healthcare company, um, we've really tried to focus our efforts on um, education and relieving customer concerns about the virus and about the spread and, and just about what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we've had our chief medical officer doing a Q&A on, um, I believe, Instagram last week. Um, we're obviously heavily promoting the stay at home, stay safe message. Uh, and we're trying to you know, our, our telehealth industry is really kind of in the spotlight right now as an alternative to in-person uh, doctor visits. And so we're trying to educate people on telehealth, why it is safe um, and the capabilities um, as we're, you know, so, so that people have a higher level of confidence to engage with it um, moving forward. And then, you know, from a more practical standpoint as well, we're getting, um, we're getting uh, contacted by uh, a much higher customer contact level at the moment, sorry. Um, and we're really helping people to manage the treatments that they're already receiving from us. Uh, we're doing things like helping them understand how to pause their treatment, um, how to update addresses as, as the sort of lockdowns went into place. We saw a lot of people moving in with family members, especially older family members, if they knew they needed to look after them. Uh, for uh, the you know the midterm, and so we've just been sort of communicating uh, proactively to our entire group of customers as we see increases in individual requests on on uh, subscription management. Yeah, I'll jump in here. This is Neil. Um, you know, from from our side, you know, some of the things we're doing um, is just communicating, you know, very regularly with our customers. I mean. Uh, you know, we, we send daily, um, you know, uh, emails out to our customers, updating them on what's going on around the world. We split it by region so, so they can focus in on, on what's the most critical for them and their supply chain. Um, we host uh, uh, one or two webinars a week um, focused on air, ocean, customs, you know, crisis management, whatever it might be. We have a lot of experts, um, you know, within our company and, and we want to share those insights um, with our with our uh, customers and anybody else who's who's interested. So, um, you know, we we've been doing that since the start of this crisis. We've been doing it for a long time, but but we've really um, uh, increased the frequency, um, and we've gotten a lot of you know positive uh, comments on that because I think a lot of people are starved for good information, um, not what they read see here on you know the TV because it may not be relevant to their specific um, situation, um, and so we're trying to make it super relevant. Um, and, and that's something that we're just doing a lot of um, and, uh, and, and we'll continue to do that until uh, people don't, don't need it anymore. Yeah, we've, I've been um, really enjoying the Flexport uh, blog posts um, and it is really important that you're going to a reputable source to get that updated industry information um, because you can, you can read it, you know, they're pretty, um, inf they're informative and current and they really give you a good insight into the impact of your own business. Yeah, I agree. I think at this point it's a good, like, it's a good time for companies to, to really like be seen as the experts in, in their space. So going like being the, the source of, of truth, um, around shipping, around air freight, around whatever it is that that um, your customers care about, I think is, is one great way to to add value to your customers uh, without freaking them out. And I think, like, to, to answer this question, like, there are two two ways for me to answer this. On like, on the one hand, there are things that that we do as a business, and then there are other things that I see our customers do to connect more deeply with their customers, and and both are very interesting. Like, I, what we do, um, we've been seeing 
an increase in customers signing up that are uh, previously offline businesses and are, are now trying to become online businesses. So there is a lot of consulting going on at this point. So at this point, it's not even necessarily about trying to, to sell them our product, but just trying to be as helpful as possible and, and consulting customers as they become online businesses. And then we think about how to do that in the most scalable way. Um, it, it, given the, the amount of customers or, or potential new customers coming in, asking all the same questions, and then we only having a certain amount of customer service people, it started becoming a lot to just respond to every question, to, to every email one by one. So last week we started hosting uh, webinars where people can, where the most common questions will be answered. And we, we saw really good engagement there. Um, when I look at what our customers are doing and our customers, the majority of them are e-commerce stores and, and direct to consumer brands, I've seen great examples of them like forming community and making sure that they, they stay close to their customers. So I've seen people host um, happy hours together. I think a, a like modern aperitif company called House, I saw them host virtual happy hours. Um, I've just seen very interesting ways for smaller direct to consumer brands to, to um, make sure that they provide a platform for people to connect with each other um, in, in this time where everyone's at home and, and feeling somewhat lonely. And I think it's if it's coming, like especially smaller companies coming from a more authentic place um, that have a much easier time doing that than large companies. Uh, and, and I wanted to jump in here, Laura, you mentioned something about uh, the authenticity, which I think is really important. And uh, I know that when we initially got together to discuss this, you guys all talked about transparency and how, how that's important. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, why that is a value that you're really emphasizing going forward? Uh, for me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I think it is, um, I mean, customers are, are coming to us to try to get answers at this point. And then tra transparency, like it, there is this mix between you want to be as you, you really, you, you want to share what they need to know and you, you can't sugarcoat it because uh, their, their businesses are relying on that. But then you need to like also translate it into a, in, into a way that it's not um, causing people to panic. So it's it's that interesting dynamic of like, you wanna be as informative as possible, really transparent there, uh, but you, you don't wanna, I don't know, blast out that email, blast out that information randomly in a, in a mass email. You maybe wanna be having these conversations in a more customized way, one by one-on-one -on -one or in a, in a blog post um, is to make sure that people aren't just randomly getting an email like that in, in their inbox and, and they don't know what to do with it. They don't have anyone to discuss this with. Um, so I, and then I also think in, in terms of, um, like content or, or email outreach, like you have to understand the, as a business, you have to understand these days that people are just busy doing like they, they everyone is, is very anxious and, um, Getting an email from a company might not be what what really what they're looking forward to. So just thinking about how to be sensitive in, in the content that you send, in the emails that you send, how to be uh, informative, but also delightful and not just adding more anxiety on, onto the customer's plates. That's a great point. Nick, Neil, do you have anything to yeah. add? Well, I, I'll just, this is Neil, I'll just, I just want one comment to that, you know, when it comes to transparency, you know, that, that's a, kind of the cornerstone of, of how, you know, why, why Flexport even exists is that, you know, the, 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 the freight forwarding, the logistics business in general kind of operates in a very opaque sort of black box world. Um, and, and I think our customers deserve better, right? They, they, need, they need more transparency, not only in where their freight is, and the status of it, but they also need transparency in terms of, hey, how'd you come up with the rate? Why is why is it priced the way it is? Just you know, give me visibility into that, and and you know that that's what our mission is: is that you know we are creating a much more transparent experience um, for our customers, which which effectively then levels the playing field. And so a lot of small customers, you know you know, get the same sort of treatment as larger customers, you know, who, who, who might move, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to spend on their supply chain. So, um, uh, you know, I think it's, it's just super important. Um, and, and I, and, and, you know, technology is going to make this possible. Um, you know, and if you don't, I think if you don't move in this direction going forward, I think, you know, customers are going to deselect you as a provider because, 
you know, they, 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 they don't want to live in an opaque world where they don't know what the heck is going on. Yeah, you want to be informative um, and give them the tools that they need to manage their business well, uh, but also deliver a message, you know, knowing that everyone's sort of suffering in the same way at the moment and be empathetic to one another. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, to wrap up, um, before we dive into, a, we have a plethora of questions to go through. Um, and before we get into that, because I want to reserve some time for that, um, I wanted to open up the floor for any sort of final thoughts. I know this is going to be a continuing conversation, but would love to get uh, any final thoughts um, from the, the group here uh, that we can lead the audience with. Um, yeah, this is Nick. I'll, I can start. I, I think really um, you just want to walk away from this and with a great understanding of your supply chain and understanding how stable it is um, in the long run. Uh, I think, you know, we're in this for the foreseeable future and you need to do everything necessary to make sure your business can survive through this and into the future. So just, you know, educating yourselves, um, you know, following up on all the messages we've delivered about supply chain diversification um, and thinking about your customers and what their needs are as we go forward is, is basically the sort of message I would take from this. Yeah, um, this is Neil. I, I, I would I would agree. I would agree. I think, you know, um, I think, you know, your, your, your best weapon <laughs> is to be informed um, and, and to ask questions and, uh, and, and to go to reliable sources to, to get that. And I think that, you know, a lot of people took their supply chains for granted, took the cost for granted. They, they weren't really concerned about it as much. And I, I think that, you know, over the past couple of years, we've learned that, wow, we, we really need to focus on this. And, and there are probably some different decisions we need to take, um, you know, going forward. And, 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 and I see that debate is going gonna, is gonna to get quite lively and continue for, um, for the foreseeable future, because I think, you know, we're, we're in for a period of not less volatility, but probably, you know, greater volatility for, for, the, for the near future. And Laura, did you have anything you wanted to wrap up with? I don't have much to add here. I would say like one generic advice that, that we've been talking about with um, our board members is like that now is the time to preserve cash. Like if, if you, um, I mean, it's, it's obvious, but I'll, I think it's, it's the most important thing right now, just making sure that you have enough runway to get out of um, the, the situation and make it through the next 18 something months. So any any experiment, anything that you've been playing with in the past that doesn't work well, like uh, now is, is, is time to kill the experiments that are not working. Now it's the time to like make sure that you're focusing on, on what really works. Awesome, thank you. Um, we actually had a, a question come in in terms of, um, in particular to, to you, Laura, uh, I run a 3PL service that is primarily for Amazon private label sellers. A lot of our clients are worried that Amazon is no longer accepting new inventory. Um, the majority concern, though, is that it's difficult to find competitive shipping label prices. Platforms like eBay and Wayfair are great with their discounted shipping labels. However, how can Shippo help here? Yeah. And yeah, it's a good question. I think it's uh, that the Amazon or fulfilled by Amazon situation is an interesting one. And it's... Um, I think you have good reason to be concerned there and like trying to look, for, we see a bunch of people trying to look for different solutions now. If you're specifically looking for someone who, who helps you with a warehouse, so Shippo does not have a warehouse. We have a bunch of partners and if you want to follow up uh, with an email, we can refer you to, to partners afterwards. So um, what, I, I think it's a good time to figure out where else you can store your inventory uh, in addition to, to fulfilled by Amazon. Um, if you want to be shipping out of your own garage or your own workspace, I think that's a pretty good idea to do in the interim as well. It gives you slightly more control over this. Um, we, we're seeing questions here as well about how fulfillment centers have been affected. And uh, I, I, uh, a few of our clients have started closing down their fulfillment centers already, um, especially if there's been a sick case in there. So if you want to get more control over your shipping, it might be a good time to do the shipping yourself. And um, that's for sure something that, that we can help with. Like we give customers access to discounted shipping rates and uh, an easier way to print labels from all different shipping providers. 
Awesome. And I'm just going to stop my screen real quick to just access the plethora of questions. So just bear with me. Um, another question that we had is, uh, with the reduced demand on non-essential products and increased shipping costs, are companies reducing, do you think, their prices to maintain revenue? Hmm. So uh, I'll give it a first try. I, I don't have a perfect answer here because, sure. uh, but but I, what we've been seeing is that a lot of our customers are trying to stimulate demand by by giving um, their customers discounts. So across the board, we see retailers giving like twenty five percent off their their entire store to uh, trigger more demand. Yeah, I just to add to that. So I I, I when I think about me personally, I think it's uh people are not buying not because of uh the price of things necessarily but more because of the sort of limit in ability to shop for certain items i think that um any sort of reduction in price is really going to be looked at as um, a company trying to help people who are in a tough time and dealing with this at the moment and i think it's positive um I, I, it's going to reflect really positively on the company that is doing that. Um, and yeah, I mean, and should hopefully result in sort of uh, sales being sort of um, increased as a result. We have another question here. How have fulfillment centers been affected? Do you see them getting affected? Uh, yeah, I think we just touched on this before, but um, mm -hmm. certainly fulfillment centers, uh, if they are, fulfilling non-essential goods, a lot of them I've seen closing. Uh, and then as, you know, we're going to see a decreased throughput as they're taking measures to protect the uh, employees in those locations. Uh, it's just going to be generally slower. We might have reduced hours as well. Um, and certainly if there's a case of someone being infected at a fulfillment center, most likely you're going to see at least a 48 to 72 hour shutdown for like a real deep cleaning before they're back up and running. And you have no access to your inventory at that time. And you certainly wouldn't um, want to continue shipping if that was a situation. Um, we have a question here, uh, given the challenges and risks with holding inventory, and I know we've touched on this in bits and pieces throughout the session, do you see a shift in the on-demand production in particular verticals or industries? Uh, that's a good question. I think um, on-demand production, as long as you have good access to all of the raw materials required to, to do that production, um, is is probably a good idea. I know for us, um, that is not the situation we're in. We, you know, we hold inventory and we pull from it. And we are looking the other way to be holding additional inventory to mitigate for any, um, for any delays in our supply chain. Yeah, this is Neil, I'll just chime in on that. I mean, I think, you know, there, there's certain industries that, that are pretty well set up for that on-demand sort of production. You know, you can think of like Dell Computer or somebody like that. I do think some industries, it's, 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 it's quite difficult, um, you know, for, for them to do that. I mean, it, it, it's not a bad idea. I think implementing it um, could require a completely different sort of uh, infrastructure and technology to be able to do that. Uh, how can you move to a distributed supply chain to reduce the risk of being impacted? Uh, what role will drop shipping play? Um, I think, uh, so I, I kind of see them as two separate questions, um, but the distributed supply chain, um, I think, you know, it could translate into many things. One that we talked about earlier is like diversification of your manufacturing partners uh, geographically um, uh, to help prevent any impact from things like these happening. Um, but also, you know, if you're looking from a fulfillment standpoint, then um, standing up uh, additional fulfillment locations in multiple states obviously that has a really positive impact on delivery times to customers anyway but it will also help you as we're seeing these states taking um, you know their own regional steps to prevent the spread of the virus um, and obviously going forward um, that sort of um, you know makes sense just in general uh, to protect yourself in case anything else happens 
uh, from the drip drop shipping side of things, uh, as um, we talked about earlier, you know, taking control of your own uh, fulfillment uh, and depending on the size of your business and your ability to do that is obviously good protection against relying on third party fulfillers who may um, have to shut down for one reason or another. Another question here. Um, do you think that carriers could be shut down or will they be able to adapt? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll chime in here first. I don't know if you're referring to, to ocean or air carriers. I'll, I'll go air first. Um, uh, I, I absolutely think that there are many air carriers that are going to be uh, extremely vulnerable um, during this time period. Um, uh, you know, this has been uh, the black swan event for the industry. Um, one that, that several airlines will not recover from. Um, you know, those with, with, uh, with uh, um, more leverage balance sheets, um, you know, are probably going to find it very, very difficult to come through this unscathed, if not, you know, if they come through it at all. Um, and so there, there's several airlines on that watch list, um, you know, probably 25 to, to, to 30 that are extremely, extremely vulnerable. Now, you know, some of these could be saved, you know, through, you know, full government bailouts because they, there's a national security interest in keeping them alive. There are many others that won't. Um, but because, you know, they, they don't fit that mold. Um, on, on the ocean side, I think the ocean carriers are going to have, uh, you know, a, a tough time, um, particularly given, you know, the, the demand drop off that we're expecting to see on the commercial side um, here for Q2 and into Q3. Um, there are a lot more blank sailings now as they're trying to keep rates um, a, a bit elevated. Um, but it, it is going to be a tough time overall uh, for the asset owners, um, you know, for sure. Air or ocean, uh, 2020 is going to go down probably as one of the worst years they've ever had. Okay. Um, anything else? Uh, wanted to make sure, uh, Nick or Laura, anything else you wanted to add on, on carriers, whether it's ocean freight, parcel? Yeah, so I, I'm seeing a bunch of good questions in here still, and I, I know we're running out of time, so I just want the attendees to know, like, if you have more questions, please submit them, and, and we'll try to follow up with your questions via email to, yes. to get them answered. But yeah, I appreciate that uh, we've had some really good participation and awesome questions in here, so thank you for that. Wonderful. Um, all right, so uh, wanted to wrap things up. Uh, by giving everyone some information uh, on all of the, the panelists today. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Laura mentioned this earlier, but we did announce a uh, weekly SHPO service uh, hours webinar that uh, we launched last week. And most of you will see that come through in the next couple of, uh, next couple of days. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and then if you have any questions uh, about anything uh, during this COVID crisis, please reach out and let us know. Same thing with Flexport and Hims and Hers. Um, we just want to reemphasize that transparency is super important to us. Um, and then last but not least, as a reminder, uh, we have been recording this session. We'll be cleaning it up, polishing it, and then sending it out to everyone that registered within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, thank you, Laura, Neil, Nick. Uh, we appreciate the discussion and uh, you'll be seeing uh, more of these types of discussions uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.